Hello, I am Joel Bloom at New Jersey Institute of Technology. We pride ourselves on being part of the Newark community and its advancements in technology, the economy, and the growth of the city. That's why we are very proud to partner with the Caucus Educational Corporation to produce Newark at the Crossroads right here on the NGIT campus. We hope you enjoy this special series. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by New Jersey Institute of Technology, Prudential Financials Global Communications Department, Audible.com, Barnabas Health, Life is Better Healthy, TD Bank, Josh S. Weston, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Steve Adubato coming to you from the New Jersey Institute of Technology, the Jim Wise Theater. This is Newark at a crossroads, and one guy who knows why it's at a crossroads and the direction we need to go in is Dr. Donald Sebastian, President and Chief Executive Officer, New Jersey Innovation Institute at NJIT. Good to see you, Don. Thank you, and thank you for allowing me to be a frequent flyer on your show. Yeah, we love it because we learn something new every time. Don, let me ask you, you were telling our producers, and it's fascinating to me, industrial innovation. Yes. While you guys are involved in it here in NGIT, and it's a key part of Newark, there's a lot of history. Put there this is. in perspective. There is. So uh, often lost that New Jersey was really the home and the birthplace for so many of great American industry. And a lot of it happened right here in Newark. We all know that Edison is a patron saint of New Jersey. But who knew that he actually did his first work here in Newark? His first invention, the stock ticker tape, was manufactured in several different factories he ran here in Newark. And his first R&D lab that became the prototype later for Menlo Park in West Orange was right here in downtown Newark. The building still exists. It's right across the street from the, from the Devil's uh, Prudential Arena. How important, Don, and fast forward, because we talk about Newark at a crossroads. We talked to Dr. Bloom, Joel Bloom, your president, about this, about Newark being a college town. A big piece of that is the innovation piece. Talk about this new institute. Talk about the potential it has to make a big difference in the city of Newark and beyond, but yeah. primarily in the city. Right. So going back in time, you could see how important that technological and industrial innovation was. It really built not only the economic basis, but the employment basis for most of northern New Jersey. A lot of it's centered here. We're trying to recreate that capability, but it's a different time. It's an era where you won't have a garage inventor, right? An individual is not necessarily going to start the industries of the future. It takes uh, more people. It takes a, a huge cross-section of technological skills and business skills, big investment in equipment. And frankly, it takes the sort of resources that even many industries these days can't afford to do by themselves. So we've created something which is designed to tap into the assets of the university, to be able to bring in faculty and students, all who have imagination, who have technological depth and skills, they also have another job. Give us an example. So for, example. for example, uh, we're working now on a whole project to dramatically change the way in which we do healthcare delivery. Healthcare right? delivery? Healthcare systems delivery. There is about $200 million a year in avoidable hospitalization costs right here in Newark. Information technology can be an important ingredient of how we do practice transformation. It's a very, it's a business systems re-engineering, but the primary goal is to move patients from depending on the hospital for primary care to relying on the family physician. As you and I probably grew up with a Doc Welby kind of environment, that doesn't exist in most well, What does technology centers. have to do with so that? So technology becomes a way in which we create a the productivity, the horsepower for the physician to be able to handle an increased population base, but also the way of gluing together the physician, who is the primary care deliverer, to the specialists, 
that are be part of the healthcare delivery, to the hospitals who are in fact going to be engaged in part of it, to the clinical labs, to the pharmacies, to the social workers, to medical transportation service. All of these different entities have to be gelled to work to provide delivery for the individual. And if you can get that to work, the real future comes when we get the individual plugged into that IT network as well. And now it's a prevention is worth a pound of cure. Now you have all the opportunity to bring in uh, uh, information technology like diet tracking and exercise tracking that gets fed back now to your physician, to the various types of medical devices that are becoming down uh, as inexpensive as a, as, a, as a wristband to be monitoring uh, uh, your, your state of health. And that's the role of a university to and be. So this is something that there is a role of an institute like ours that can bring in those who are on the advanced front end of pattern recognition, data analysis that can extract information out of that environment. Those who are working on sensory technologies that can be brought to bear on inexpensive, affordable, and distributable uh, forms of, of medical monitoring technologies, all of whom are also coming out of our business school and understand how to rethink the processes that have grown up in the stovepipes of the primary care physician versus the hospital versus the pharmacy and the insurers. So, but down to this first, we've had some of these discussions before, but and they're fascinating to me in terms of the possibilities. Bring it back to Newark, though. Mm -hmm. Talk about talk to folks watching, not just in Newark, but throughout the tri-state, beyond the tri-state region, as to what that potentially means to the economy of the city, to jobs in the city, sure. to the potential that the city could have one day again. So that's a, an example where you start to breed the businesses who understand how to function in that environment, the software developers, the technology developers, by being a hub for these sorts of activities. And I'll give you some other examples. You then start to be a place where people want to be. They want to be close to where the action is, particularly for small and emerging businesses. They can't afford to fly all over the world to be the place where their concept is being put into play. We have related in, in this an initiative that we call Smart City to make Newark. Smart City. Smart City. Make Newark really an example of what people are calling the internet of everything. The idea that not only are all of us wired interconnected, Sensory technologies could allow us to have more efficient transportation systems, more efficient civil infrastructure, a greater degree of, of uh, uh, responsive civil services. All of these are the great environment that happens as, in a sense, data becomes what electricity was in Edison's era. The idea that we can use data technologies to infuse in all kinds of existing products and services is now possible because the internet has gotten off the desktop mm. and into the world around us. Well, by the way, what about the yeah. students? who graduate from New York being called a college town, yeah. a lot of colleges, in addition to NJIT, those who graduate here, mm -hmm. from here, they more likely to stay here and then invest here and build a family here, and that builds a city. Well, imagine if all this happens, there's a twofold benefit. One, while they're here, they're going to be engaged in working on the development of their own future. B, they're going to develop ideas from that experience that are even greater, perhaps, than the ones they worked on as, as, as apprentices. And thirdly, we make this such a cool place to live and work, they're going to want to stay here. Right? More than just a good bar scene, which I'm sure will evolve when you have a high density of young professionals, it will be a model urban environment. That's really what we're trying to drive. So it begins by developing the jobs of those who are doing the technology work. It creates installer, service tech jobs, all sorts of ancillary positions mm. that come to support this. And after a while, it starts to build a culture where this is like the Silicon Valley of the future. Give me 30 seconds on Military Park, because we're going to be talking about the guy who developed it. Yes, yes. 30 seconds on that and the technological So, so piece. Military Park is our first foray Military into Park the is a key city. park in the city of Newark, across from uh, NJ Pack. It's in New Jersey Performing Arts Center. It's a huge yes. piece of the equation. Go ahead. Right. And so the developers have the ambition to make that a good example of how we might put technology into a public space so? for greater advantage. So imagine if we have interactive displays your 50-inch your plasma screen, but now it can interact with your personal device. So you can get information about what's happening in the park. You can figure out when the light rail is coming, so how you pick the train to get you back to Penn Station if you're a visitor. You can have a whole types of uh, what we call push advertising, things that promote the businesses that are mm. here in, in Newark that would be interested to you, and how does it know? Because what you carry on your hip already is telling the world what you're interested in doing. So the idea is, again, create a test bed environment where we can plug and play all these ideas and now people can go from just testing it on their family to actually testing it out in the population. Dr. Don Sebastian, President and CEO, New Jersey Innovation Institute at NJIT. Every time you join us, 
we uh, grow and learn from it, and uh, we're honored and pleased to be your partners here on the campus of NJIT for this special series. Newark is at a crossroads. You Thank bet. you, Don. Appreciate it. Good. We can't possibly be done already. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we have other interesting... <laughs> That's why you're going to stay for the other ones. Good. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. All Thanks, right. Don. Thanks. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Newark at a Crossroads is honored to be joined by Reverend Dr. William Howard, Jr., pastor of Bethany Baptist Church, uh, formed in the 1870s. 1871 is the official organizing date, 143 years. The first congregate, Baptist congregation founded by the people of African descent in Newark. That's right. And after the riots of 1967, tell us something important that happened with that church. Well, Bethany had been located, I think, in three different places in Newark in its life, but uh, in, in the uh, days following the rebellion, they decided to build a new church right in the Central Ward. Mm. And uh, the New York Times actually did a full page with pictures of construction and the whole thing centered on that very theme, the church that dared to hope about the prospects of the city. i got to ask you something. And by the way, the Central Ward was with the heart, the heart of where the uh, riots happened in the city in 1967. Um, you got a lot of places you could be. You chose to come to Newark because? Well, in some ways, I'm going backward in my career. Um, I began out of seminary in an international responsibility. Then I became president of a theological school. And uh, pastoring a local congregation was not something I had experienced. And I hungered for that. Mm. Uh, and, of course, the word that Newark was uh, the Renaissance city, new things were happening, and I was very interested in understanding how a city with so many challenges might rebound. Uh, and, and, of course, New Jersey has been my state for 45 years. So I came to Newark with a sense of call, but also with a sense of curiosity and commitment. You know, while Bethany is a church, there's also a charter school. Yes. There's a nonprofit organization, and you're totally involved and engaged in, the, in, the, in this community in so many ways. If you were to describe the uh, three biggest problems, challenges, obstacles this city faces right now, what are they? And are they that much different than they were in the 1960s? Not different at all, really. I think we have pathologies that have developed since the 60s because of the basic root challenges that came up from the 50s after the Second World War. We have capital flight from Newark. Uh, money left the city. Money left the city. Talent left the city. And by the way, this is not so different, as you know, from uh, all of the post-industrial cities of our nation. We see Detroit uh, as, a, as a case on the news about what is happening there. Something very similar uh, happened in Detroit. So we are having to rebuild, uh, attract new capital, while reserving a place in Newark for its current residents. Because if we don't, we'll chase those people out, bring in a new, whole new population, reinvent the city. And I don't think that's good for what we ought to aspire to here. You know, Reverend, one of the keys to keeping those folks here is to have a strong spiritual foundation, a uh, place for people to be mm -hmm. through difficult times, your mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. Others have been that as well. In your view, what is the place for spirituality, that religious foundation, particularly in a city that struggles so much? What's the place? Well, I think community and a, a sense of encouragement that is attached to reality. Uh, I dare say there are churches that don't major in discussion about the concrete underlying problems mm. of education and so forth. Uh, but if you have a keen awareness of the things that fundamentally cause problems, and then you offer some kind of hope in the midst of that, I think that's the, the mix that we want. And Bethany has really done this long before I came. Mm. Uh, and, and I think we've continued this. We've, we've made it stronger. 
uh, and, and in the future. I think the trajectory we're on, you'll see more and more of this. Keeping the spiritual content, being clear that we are a worshiping community founded on faith, but we want to make a concrete difference as mm. we are with adult literacy. As Summer you know. Freedom School. Summer Freedom School. Which Tell is, folks what that is. Pardon? Tell folks what that is, Reverend. Well, the Freedom School <clears throat> is associated with the Children's <clears throat> Defense Fund today, but it was really uh, begun in 1964 in Mississippi. Uh, students came from all over the country teaching young black children in segregated Mississippi, Shakespeare and Plato and all those wonderful things about the world that public education in Mississippi simply did not provide or allow. And so Marion Edelman, uh, recognizing the deficits in these post-industrial cities, mainly in the North, uh, inaugurated the Freedom School back in the 80s uh, we've sent our young people to Tennessee to be trained by her organization. And now we've just completed uh, eight years of the Freedom School. Uh, one year we were crazy. We had 150 kids in the, in the church, which was just too many. The demand is there. Yes. So we've decided 75 kids. And all we focus on, Steve, is uh, increasing your love of reading and developing a sense of community service and we always go over our limits so this year we had 85 kids we have slightly more boys than girls right and we don't play basketball uh, we don't go swimming we hit the books and yet we have a long list of people waiting to get in Reverend I need to ask you this while Bethany is doing these tremendous things that go outside of what some of us um, some of us would, would like to see our church expand some of our efforts, but that's another story. I need to ask you this. With so much uh, violent crime in and around the community that your church resides in, how do you stay so positive or how do you keep the congregation so positive when they see s so much crime, murder, particularly of young people, mm -hmm. drugs, gang violence? How do you preach a positive message in the midst of that? Well, Steve, let me say that hope is related to tomorrow. It's never about today or yesterday. Hope is about what is possible despite what we know now. So my obligation, and I've been at Bethany now approaching 15 years, mm. I've never preached the same sermon twice. And I'm always aiming for a vision beyond this veil of tears. Now, again, it's an empty vision if people think the preacher is not conscious of these problems. We are just a few blocks from the youth detention center. As you say, crime is all around us. Uh, now, okay, but for every negative thing we hear about Newark, as a person who knows Newark, you know there's something good happening. So then I have to uh, bring more attention to the good things that are going on. University Heights Charter School, mm. I am a founder, uh, let me just say, Today, we are anticipating in September a ribbon cutting for an upper school. So we've had a great run at the primary grades, but the demand for what we offer there, which has to do with ethical living, not right. about religion, ethical but living. ethical living. A demand for that too. Oh my Lord, the, the way parents want this for their children, the excitement in the children's faces, uh, so you're chipping away little by little, highlighting the positive things you do, and hopefully keeping people focused on what is possible. Reverend Howard, you know, growing up uh, around here, those of us who are part of the city, mm -hmm. always known the difference that you've made. And it is an honor that you make. And so it's an honor to have you as part of this series, Nork at a Crossroads, because since the city's at a crossroads, we need leaders like you keeping us on the straight and narrow. Thank you, Reverend. Well, you're very kind. Thank you, Steve. You want to stay right there. OK. We'll be right back from NJIT right after this. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. 
We're pleased to welcome Dan Biederman, president of Biederman Redevelopment Ventures. Uh, you are the guys who did Bryant Park, not a bad job. First thing in my career, I still love it. Yeah, well, we also have you, the other reason we have you is not because of Bryant Park. Military Park, the park that uh, I used to hang out in as a kid across from the um, Newark Public Library, the museum, and now NJ Pack. That is something really special on June 4th? June 3rd, it formally opened, but we really opened it soft on May 14th, Steve, and it was a success from the beginning. Tell folks, Dan, why it's so exciting, because for a lot of years before you did all that work, and I know it's going to be even better moving forward, it, it was not happening there. It is happening now. What's happening? Theoretically, it's exciting because so many people have said to me, what you did works in midtown Manhattan with a bunch of yuppies around, but it'll never work in a city <laughs> that needs more help. So this is proving that's not the case. The users have been outstanding. They thank us more than the people in Bryant Park thank us for our work. And why it's so important in downtown Newark is it's a nice uh, link between NJ Pack and the arena and Pru. Pru's moving in right next to the park. Uh, so there's a string of just wonderful stuff in downtown Newark that cities three times its size can't claim. And we hope the park will continue to be one of those things. As we show some, some visuals of it, Dan, describe what it is and then again what it's going to be. It's a four or five acre park in downtown, which most people are vague about the location of. It's a thoroughly programmed park in cities where there's a perception of past danger. You want to get knots of people in to make the park feel comfortable, especially to women who are the most important users. So we're running about 60% women, which is unbelievable. It's higher than Bryant Park. Women are very careful about their personal safety. And some of the things that are drawing women into the park are poetry readings, uh, uh, games, uh, which are out there for free use, exercise classes, concerts. Whoa, 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 exercise classes in Military Park? Absolutely, people are doing yoga. And capoeira <laughs> and Zumba and all the things we're doing in Manhattan. In Newark, showing it's up. you don't have to be in Manhattan for this to happen. No, it's a very a loyal crowd of people who are thrilled that the public parks are being programmed for stuff that they'd have to pay for if they went to a health club. Talk about the Wi-Fi piece. Coming up, uh, it's uh, thanks to great help from Pru and uh, Audible. Don uh, Katz. Don, oh, Don Katz at Audible is going to be part of the series. He's a great guy. Yep. And, Talk about uh, that piece of it. Um, people will have very good um, Wi-Fi. You know the thing, Steve, about Wi-Fi. I go to other cities where we have parks, and uh, people will say, oh, we have Wi-Fi in our park. And then somebody across the room says, yeah, but it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, so, it's great, except it doesn't work. You announce it, you put it in, but it's got to work. So this will work. We've done it an, on a neighborhood basis in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan. And uh, my guy who did that is really the operating guy in, in military parks. So this will be very useful for people to continue working during their lunch hour, which has been critical at Bryant Park. You know, it's funny. You talk about um, lunch hour. Uh, our, producer, our producer, Jackie Tricarico, and I, we were, Jackie, remember we were teaching a class over at NYU? Um, the NYU campus, not downtown, but midtown, right? Yep. Over by the um, New York Public Library. Oh, yes. NYU Real Estate Institute. Yeah, right. Yeah. We were teaching, I was teaching a class there, and Jackie was the teaching assistant. I remember just walking out of there because we had a break. We walk into the Bryant Park area on a Saturday. Jammed, and right? Jammed. You've got all these booths where people are selling not only food, but all kinds of other things. And I'm thinking, this is amazing. Biederman did this and his people. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Question. Thank as you. I was, it was there watching that happen and being a part of that, I thought to myself, the impact that an urban park can have on a neighborhood is extraordinary. But I'm thinking that could never happen here in Newark, could it? It is, it is. Um, I mean, uh, could it be that, is Bryant Park Bryant Park because it's New York City and we should expect a lot less here? No, uh, Bryant Park is Bryant Park because we started on it 30 years ago. So we're getting close. We always compete with the European parks like uh, uh, Luxembourg Gardens in Paris, and people always say to me, but that's had 250 years to be there. We, we're getting there. 30 years at Bryant Park. I say to people at, who watch Military Park now and say it's great, I say, where do you see it in five years? It's going to be incredibly But aren't you building better, up expectations by doing that? But uh, you know, there's always something bad that can happen. You know, there are bad guys roaming around, but if you create a sense of order with a lot of activity, cleanliness, nice restrooms, flowers everywhere, People really do observe it. Good example, we have uh, 150 movable chairs there. Everybody. Movable chairs? You can just use them wherever you want in the park. Everybody in Newark said those won't last two minutes. And we have lost two 
to pilferage so far in three months. So better record than Bryant Park had in its first months. So what does that tell you? Um, if you uh, assume the best about people and give them a pleasurable experience, they will justify your faith. What about the police piece of this whole thing, police protection, safety? We've uh, had a good relationship with uh, Newark PD, but we haven't called on them much so far. Um, we have our own uh, private guards who are on segways, which people think is kind of neat. And uh, they gently urge people to behave the right way. This is stuff that doesn't get near a felony. This is not even violations. This is just oh, little things like harassment of women or um, uh, a loud radio or whatever. And it's tamped down. And we, we're not at the point where we've had to really call on the resources. I just want to clarify when you say little things like harassment of women, you mean verbally saying something. If people are cursing or if they're drinking from an open beer can, we'll tell them no. But interestingly, we have more of that kind of behavior on the other side of the river than we've had in more New York. More in New York. So yeah. Real before, quick before I let you out of here. You're big into the impact that parks can have on a city. Oh, yes. Who got you into Newark? Ray Chambers. Was a, <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd know a, that name. I did, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I do. He, Ray, got us in, Ray Chambers got a lot of us into a lot of things in the city of Newark. Five, he called you and he said, I want you to do this. Five people. Ray, Ray, Chambers, Ray Chambers, who those of you who don't know, is an extraordinary philanthropist, committed to the city, went to Westside High School, and got 30 seconds left. He'd tell people why you said yes. Well, Other first, than the fact that Ray asked. Five people on the Manhattan side had said, to me, you know Ray Chambers? Newark needs you, you should meet him. <laughs> when I met him and we did some, another project, he was smart enough to say, what's the next thing that would be good for downtown Newark? And his staff was very able. And I said, there's a park there yeah. that you could really yeah. do. So uh, yeah. we wanted to work in a city like this. Keep doing what you're doing, we love it. Thank and you. Military Park, Dan, is gonna be great because of you and your team, and we look forward to it. Hey, Thanks listen, so let's shoot, let's do a program in Military Park. It would be great to Deal. have you. Thank you very Thank much. You. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this special edition of One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by New Jersey Institute of Technology, Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department, Audible.com, Barnabas Health, TD Bank, Josh S. Weston, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. This program has been made possible in part by the Fidelco Group. Hi, I'm Eric. You might see me as an ordinary person, but I've been living with a brain injury for nearly two years. One of my struggles is short-term memory loss. At Opportunity Project, I'm given hope and support, and I've gained my comments back through the job placement program. Despite my challenges, I have a reason to keep improving. Today, even though life has changed me, I believe that anything is possible. If you have a brain injury, you don't have to face your road to recovery alone.